Hi, it's Anthony here. Some parts of today's conversation may be triggering for some people. If you need help, no matter where you are in the world, search LGBTI Helpline. And remember, it does get better. On today's show, our next guest thought he was writing a book called Making History about the challenges our LGBTI elders faced fighting for their rights in the gay movement. Little did he know when he was pressing that record button that he was actually creating a podcast. Welcome to LGBTI Conversations, Eric Marcus. And thank you for, uh, for wanting to speak with me. You're very welcome. Take us back. You were born in 1958, New York City. Knowing what you know now with doing all the research, what was kind of happening during that time in the whole gay movement? There was very little. There was a chapter of the Mattachine Society, which was an organization founded in 1950 or 51, depending upon how you look at it, in Los Angeles by five men. Um, But the 50s in New York, this was not the center of activism in the way that uh, Los Angeles and San Francisco were, but it's we can't even ref- think of it in terms of activism. Um, it was such a different environment. A lot of the focus then by the Mattachine Society, for example, was on changing uh, policies so that gay men were not entrapped by the police. It was still a criminal uh, act to be homosexual back then too, wasn't it? Well, to engage in homosexual activity, it was illegal to have sex with somebody of the same sex. Yes. So there were the U.S. had sodomy laws that actually governed how heterosexual people behave too, but they weren't generally arrested for uh, engaging in private consensual behavior. The law was used against gay men mostly, but also against lesbians too. Would it be fair to say that during that time, the lesbians were overlooked and it was more focused on the gay guys? As any number of the women I interviewed uh, told me, they were not really so left alone. There was more animosity toward the men, um, and the men were more visible um, because women could easily room together without anyone asking questions. Women didn't engage in the kind of public sex that gay men did. So gay men were much more vulnerable to uh, being arrested by the police or entrapped by the police. In fact, one of the women I interviewed said that they were very frustrated with the men's bathroom behavior because the men were getting arrested in what were referred to as tea rooms, uh, public bathrooms. Uh, by the police. The women did not engage in that that kind of behavior. So they felt that the men were causing problems for the women. But in Los Angeles, for example, the women's bars were also raided by the police. So, And one of the women I interviewed, uh, Shirley Willer, on her way to her first uh, lesbian bar in, in the 1940s in Chicago, um, she said she was dressed in jeans and sort of mannish attire, a, a tailored blouse. And she, was, she, she described herself as a big butch. And so she was recognizable as a lesbian, as people thought of. And she was picked up by a policeman by her collar and slapped around in downtown Chicago in the evening. So um, men were more often the targets of the police, but lesbians were not left alone to live their lives. And do you find the stories of that are told less than than the male counterparts? The experiences were different. So there there were not as many stories that I heard from women of, of being beaten by the police. There were stories, though, like, again, Shirley Willer, who told me the story of in the 1940s, just after World War II. She was a nurse, and one of her uh, good friends was a guy named Barney, who was a medic in the war and worked in her hospital. And she said he was what we would describe as flaming. And he had a terrible accident. He was smoking one day, waiting for her actually to pick him up for work. And his sofa caught fire, and he was very badly burnt. And he was taken to a Catholic hospital. And she was not allowed to visit her friend. And she said he didn't receive proper care because they recognized him as queer, as she said. And uh, she said they moved heaven and earth to get him moved to a veterans hospital, and he died the next day. Uh, And she talked about how that inspired her her anger, uh, which fueled her involvement in the movement here in the U.S. She became the national president of an organization called the Daughters of Belitis, which was an organization for lesbians founded in 1955 in San Francisco. So I heard such a range of stories from people about bad things that happened to them and how they were then motivated by anger. Um, And some were also motivated by love, the search for love. They would join uh, organizations for gay people so that they could meet someone and fall in love. Now, being born in 1958, growing up, starting to come to age, that would have bring you into the mid-70s to the early (laughs) 80s. Yes. 
Yes. It, it, now, see, now I feel like one of the dinosaurs. Uh, when I interviewed people, they were for my book. They were mostly, well, many of them were in their their sixties, seventies, and some older in their eighties. I was thirty when I started work on my book, and now I'm sixty four. So the time in which I grew up now for younger gay people seems like the dark ages, and in some ways it was. We're working on a season of the Making Gay History podcast now about the nineteen seventies. Um, called Coming of Age During the 1970s. So it's my coming of age and coming out set against the explosive development and an organizing of the gay rights movement here in the U.S. right after the Stonewall Uprising. So when I was coming of age here in New York, the level of activism was really extraordinary, but I knew nothing of it. I grew up about 15 miles west of the Stonewall Inn um, in the borough of Queens in a neighborhood called Kew Gardens. And I now think of it as the Iowa of New York. Um, I just, I didn't see Central Park until I went to college. Wow. We came to Manhattan. Yeah. We came to Manhattan twice a year. We called it the city. Um, we went to see the Christmas tree at Rockefeller Center. And every May we went to Radio City Music Hall to see a show and a movie for my sister's birthday. And that was about it. I was, I had graduated from high school. It was the summer of 1976. It was the first time I saw Greenwich Village. Really? I mean, I, that may sound that may sound shocking, <laughs> but I was pretty naive, and I wasn't even that curious. I didn't. Uh, I'm trying to think. If I went to the my I think my first time to the Metropolitan Museum was probably when I was assigned a particular sculpture in my uh, Hellenistic sculpture class in college. I went to school two hours north of New York City and came into Manhattan by train to go to the museum. So even though I grew up in New York City, I, it's not the New York that people think of. It's uh, It wasn't quite suburban because we were within walking distance of the subway line and I grew up in an apartment building, but I was not a part of that world um, until the mid-1970s when I went to Fire Island for the first time, which was the idea of my neighbor, Reverend Mullen, which I'll talk about a lot in the upcoming season. He was a widower who I thought would marry my mother, but he was much more interested in me, which was not a good thing. And I went to my first gay bar with my first crush in 1976 a bar called Charlie's East. So um, that's when I began to learn about the gay social world in New York. But I didn't learn about the history of the movement. I really knew nothing about it. I'm not sure when I first learned about the Stonewall Uprising. I, I didn't go to my first Pride March until 1980 when I was in San Francisco working as a tour director um, and was taken to the Pride March there by uh, an ex-boyfriend. So when would you say that you started to think, well, I'm not like the other boys? I was much more aware of being different earlier than when I was aware that I was attracted to members of my own sex. In summer camp, I was sent away to summer camp every year for three weeks, beginning at age eight. And as puberty set in, um, the other boys were very excited about the idea of going on raids of the girls' bunks and and getting to first base or second base or maybe even third. I, I don't know if you have this in Australia, the degrees of, of how intimate you were with a, with a girl. It's the same world um, over, I think. I guess. I couldn't understand why, why anybody would want to get up in the middle of the night and go on a, a raid of a girl's bunk to just to, to try to kiss a girl. I just didn't, it, it, it would never have occurred to me to date a girl if I hadn't been told that's what we were supposed to do. So it, it was during puberty that I became aware of my attractions. And what's interesting is I don't remember being sexually attracted to other boys my age. I found teenagers, people who were older, to be attractive to me. And I was in denial about it. I remember thinking, well, I'll just grow out of this, um, that the fantasies that I had uh, would go away. But instead of going away, they became more intense. And by the time I was 17 and fell in love for the first time, or had a wild crush, I thought, if I don't have that guy, and he was 23, I was 17, I will die. And I made him crazy. I pursued him. And he was scared um, because I was underage. And I was relentless, as only a teenager can be. And fortunately, he was a good person. Um, so he wound up being something of a mentor. So during this time, you were coming of age. The AIDS and HIV pandemic was playing on in the background. How much were you aware of what was going on during that time? Well, my awakening came before we were fully aware of um, AIDS and HIV. The virus was already spreading in New York City when I came out in the summer of 1976. And when I say come out, it was my, I mean, it was the first time I acknowledged myself uh, that I was gay and also had my first physical experience with another guy. So the virus was already spreading. 
I wasn't aware of it at all until 1981 when there was an article published in the New York Times about a rare cancer seen in 41 homosexuals. And that story was buried in the newspaper. And I didn't think it applied to me because the guys they wrote about were guys who lived in the really, really fast lane um, and had so many sexual partners in a week, something that I couldn't imagine. And um, I took comfort in thinking, well, that's not me. I don't do drugs. I don't run around that much. So it wasn't until friends started getting sick that it became a reality to me. And that would have been in, in 1983, 1984. It was, um, as the reality set in with the AIDS crisis uh, 40 years ago now, um, it was absolutely terrifying um, because uh, AIDS had such a long incubation period. At first, we were told it, it could be up to three years. So I remember my then partner and I got to the three-year mark and we thought, well, thank goodness, we don't, we're, we're okay. And then it was extended to five years and then ultimately 10 years or more. Um, and there was no test, uh, not until 1985. And it was recommended then that we not get tested and just assume we were positive because knowing you were positive and going to die would further suppress your immune system. And since there was no treatment, uh, it didn't make sense to get tested, but just to behave as if you were positive. I found it interesting you were talking on your podcast about COVID-19 and how it was similar to the AIDS HIV pandemic that you grew up in. It was so different in some ways with the COVID pandemic, because while people were often asymptomatic for a few days so you could pass on the virus, it wasn't universally fatal. It was still terrifying. And I can tell you from, from my experience of having lived through the AIDS crisis and having not gotten infected, having survived when so many of my contemporaries did not, the echoes were really loud. And I, my partner and I talked about how we were, we survived the last one. We weren't going to let this one take us. We were probably, because we're both in our 60s, we're more vulnerable. So we were fierce in being careful. Um, and I think in some ways, the people around us, especially younger people, might have thought we were a bit nuts. Um, but we're still very cautious. Um, I do not go into a crowded anything without a mask on. And when we travel by train, we wear masks. Um, I don't know if I suffer from PTSD, but the AIDS crisis was so traumatic that I take a pandemic very seriously in a way that people who didn't live through it don't and wouldn't have reason to. And for younger, I've heard older gay people, people my age, who complain that younger gay people don't understand AIDS. And I think, well, why would they? Because they didn't live through what we lived through. And for the most part, it's a manageable disease now, um, although not for everybody. And that's, uh, I was just reading about somebody who is, who is having trouble with some of the antiviral drugs. Not everyone can take all the all the antivirals. There are similarities between the two. There's so much misinformation and there was a lot of government uh, bungling around it um, and certainly conspiracy theories. But one was uh, focused on a, a specific population, an already stigmatized population, gay people, gay men. Um, this was a mass uh, pandemic that affected everyone across the board. The government behaved differently, but still, I mean, it's just, it's so clear that the systems we have in place to deal with epidemics and pandemics are not adequate universally. Yeah, and that, that's very true. And also, a lot of the conversation uh, I've had too, when it affects a mass majority of the community opposed to a minority, how quickly vaccines or people get behind to try to find cures, where, as you said, we're 40 years on, we've got treatments for AIDS and HIV, but we don't have a cure. And there were people who, who said back then it was fine that gay people were dying. They were getting what they deserved. So it was played, at least here in the U.S., it was played, played down by the by the government. Uh, the president at the time, Ronald Reagan, didn't mention the word AIDS for years after he was elected. It's shameful, but the attitude toward gay people, specifically gay men, then was so different from now. I mean, I can see that in how the monkeypox outbreak, uh, I don't know if you had the monkeypox outbreak in Australia as well, but here in New York City, of course, yet again, we were the epicenter. And to see how the press handled it and politicians handled it so differently from how it was handled in the past um, in terms of getting the word out and getting people vaccinated, letting people know in a way that helped them change their behavior quickly and essentially snuffed out the explosive uh, growth of that uh, epidemic, um, which now we never hear about in the news because it's been so uh, well dealt with. And monkeypox did make it over to Australia as well, where unfortunately we're, we're not immune to all the uh, diseases now. It's a global world and everything seems to find us down under. Yeah. And gay men travel. 
Well, um, that that is true, and we're pretty good travellers too. So um, you bring things home with you, exactly. Yes. And whether, whether you want to or not, something interesting that I thought about and actually talked about among friends is that to younger gay men, uh, especially recently, as prep became available and younger gay men stopped practicing safer sex, I said, "What happens if another virus comes along that spreads easily, and we don't know about it until it has already spread widely? You know, why do you think that HIV is the the last one to cause us problems. And then here was monkeypox um, and people had let down their guard. And there are uh, there is a cohort of gay men who are extremely sexually active. I make no judgments about that. That's their, their choice and right. But we need to be mindful of the fact that we are still human mm. and we are more open to being infected with viruses, sexually transmitted viruses um, or viruses transmitted by close contact when we have lots and lots of partners. Um, and certainly unprotected sex leaves us more vulnerable. Uh, it's just a fact of life. It's not a judgment against uh, against gay men, but it just is, you know, if you have lots of partners, it's easy to pick up and pass on something. So true. And if COVID has shown us anything, like you were saying, we think as a, a community we're beyond any kind of pandemic or epidemic happening to us, but we're still vulnerable. We're still human. These things are still around. It's still possible for many more pandemics to yeah, happen and, in every and in the, every group. And there are billions of us on this planet, and it's a it's a lot of meat for bacteria and viruses. I think that we're more likely, from everything I've read, and I'm certainly no scientist, I think we're more likely to see more of these outbreaks of, of epidemics and pandemics um, now than in the past. There yeah. are more of us, and we are moving into areas of the world where where it's easier for these viruses to pass from uh, from animals in the wild to humans. When people talk about things going back to normal, I always note that there was a new normal after HIV, um, and there will be a new normal, or there is a new normal now, but when, there's no going back. Once it's in the community, uh, it's here to stay, and even with, as we know, with the vaccines and all that, they help. Even during that time as well, I kind of thought, I've kind of got a little bit of an insight to to what was happening during the AIDS epidemic with COVID, not having lived through it personally, but also in saying that it would have been so much worse because people were actually young, healthy guys were just dying. Yes. I, I was in my 20s when, when my friends in their 20s started dying. And that was, uh, it's just a long list of people. And, I, and we just, a lot of us just happened to be unlucky that we were sexually active as young men without knowing that there was anything out there that could kill us. And for Almost everyone who got it, then it was a death sentence. It was generally a gruesome, gruesome death. One of my closest friends was left deaf and blind and incontinent and incoherent at the end. Truly horrible, horrible disease. Yeah, it was. And it's just, it's, you know, there are times that I think I still get a sinking feeling in my stomach thinking, oh my God, what if I had gotten it? I know I was exposed, but I wasn't infected. And that is really just by the grace of God. I don't believe in. God, whatever, whatever protected me, I feel very, very fortunate, you know, and that I've had the opportunity then to live and do the work that I do. Um, I hadn't been tested before I signed the contract to do my making a history book. Once I got tested, I got tested soon after I signed the contract. Before I made a, a, a bargain with God, a God I don't believe in, I said, please just let me live so I can do this book. And then I felt an obligation to some of the guys I interviewed who I knew were ill to get their stories down before they died. And um, a couple of them died before the book was even published, Vito Russo and Morty Manford. Now, that all came together when you were working at CBS in the 1980s, and you were asked to write the book? I was working at CBS News. I was a segment producer. And uh, around the time that I found out that my career at CBS was going to have limits because I was out, uh, out of the closet, um, I got a call from... Uh, an editor friend at Harper and Row, now Harper Collins, asking me, commissioning me to write a book. Um, and I did the interview. He wanted me to write an oral history of what was then called the gay and lesbian civil rights movement. And that's how I came to do these interviews. I would not have thought to do it myself. It's a crazy project, sort of a massive effort. And I didn't feel qualified. But um, at that time, I had wanted to be on camera at CBS News. I wanted to be a correspondent and uh, spoke with a senior executive who handled uh, what was called on-air talent and to ask her if they would ever put anybody on the air who was openly gay, because there was nobody nationally on the air uh, as a correspondent who was openly gay. And she said, no, they wouldn't. So I decided to leave my job at CBS and to do this book. And the best thing I did when I was still at CBS was to ask my boss who had worked for National Public Radio in the US 
uh, previously what his colleagues used to record their interviews. And I must have thought at the time that someday someone would want to use my audio for something, not knowing that in 2015, I would revisit my own archive and use it for a podcast. Because of course, there's no such thing as podcasts in 1988. And if I hadn't used broadcast quality equipment, I likely could not have done the podcast. Because it was pretty amazing to think that you were gathering these uh, oral histories of the gay and lesbian civil movements and speaking to people all over the country. And some really interesting stories, as you were saying before, you were speaking to people who you knew were going to pass away through uh, complications of AIDS. And you were able to get that history down. But also looking back now, because it's so cool retro, being able to, you know, everything's so digital, being able to use a recorder where you actually press the button and start a recording <laughs> it, and then create this podcast in, in 2015, as you said. It's amazing to think that all of these stars aligned for you to do that and to bring it to another generation. Oh, there were so many stars that aligned, including the first person I asked to work with me on tape, who was my next door neighbor, who had worked for the BBC and NPR in Arkansas what was supposed to be an education project, an education project that we were going to build around uh, short excerpts of these interviews. And she started editing uh, and got down to about 18 minutes with a goal of reaching six minutes. And she said, this sounds like a podcast. Um, but she didn't know how to make podcasts. So she decided to go to podcast school for five days. And one of the teachers at the podcast school had recently founded what turned out to be the hottest podcast production company in the US and a lesbian who loved what we were doing. And she said, um, what can I do to help? And took us under her wings. And five weeks later, because we had to have something out five weeks later as part of the grant required us to have something out by LGBT History Month in October 2016, we had five weeks and we launched Making Gay History in five weeks, along with a fully fledged website with episode notes and archival photos. And no one told us that you can't do that. Um, I produced another podcast, one on the Holocaust, and uh, we took two years to develop that podcast. Wow. Yeah. So this is all accidental. I can't really take a lot of credit for it. My producer, Sarah Birmingham, was the one who came up with the idea for the podcast. Um, and in fact, we're working together on this next season, Coming of Age during the 1970s. So what would have been your favorite interview you did during that time? I was afraid you'd ask that question. I had a lot of favorite interviews, um, but two that always come to mind were uh, among the first that we turned into episodes for the podcast. One was with Lisa Ben, whose real name was Edith Ide who wrote the first magazine. She, she called it a magazine, but really it was a zine. She typed through five times on her office typewriter using five sheets of carbon paper at RKO Radio Pictures in Hollywood in 1947. She called it Vice Versa, America's Gayest Magazine. And among other things, she wrote a column called The Whatchama Column, in which she wrote her hopes and dreams for the future. And I learned about that and also learned that she had uh, been a singer in gay clubs in the 1950s and 60s because she didn't like the drag queens who were the popular entertainment at the time who often made jokes about lesbians. So she wrote her own songs and her own lyrics um, and her own lyrics to popular songs at the time and sang in the clubs. And I found her. Which, uh, well, we didn't have the internet then. I made a lot of phone calls. And on the 25th phone call, she picked up um, and I got to sit with her on her front porch in Burbank, California, and ask her about her magazine. And also, uh, she sang about 45 minutes worth of music for me. So that was one of our first episodes. And then um, Wendell Sayers, who was 86 when I interviewed him, who was the first Black attorney to work for the state attorney general in Denver, Colorado. He attended one of the early Madison Society conventions in Denver in 1959. And what I found most striking about him, besides the risk he took just attending a convention as a Black man in an organization that was almost entirely white, which certainly meant that he was recognizable and at risk for losing his job, he spoke about his experience of being sent to a major uh, medical center uh, where he was diagnosed as a homosexual in 1919 when he was 16 years old. I got to sit with all of these people and go on time travel back into their lives as far back as 1919. So I had a lot of favorites. Um, I liked almost everyone I interviewed. There were a few I didn't. And in the podcast, I let people know how I felt about certain people like Hal Call, who led a coup of the um, Madison Society in 1953, who, when I interviewed him, was the owner of the Circle J Porn Theater in San Francisco. Um, who actually uh, made a mistake with his calendar and thought I was there to be shot for a porn film, which I talk about, <laughs> which I talk about in the episode. Yeah, I arrived in the, uh, I had to walk through the porn theater to get to his office. And he was sitting on a, a couch wearing just a shirt. He was in his underwear and his uh, socks and shoes. And the 
video camera was pointed toward where I was going to be sitting, and he had a bottle of lube and a towel on the table. So how do you go about breaking uh, that to someone saying, no, actually, I'm here to just do a, uh, an oral verbal, well, that- <laughs> you know, a verbal well, oral interview, but, but not in the way you think? Right, right. I, mean, I wouldn't have used the word oral. I said, I said it was actually the second interview with him. I said, Dick, I, I'm not here for that. Um, and he was fine. Didn't put his pants on, but he just, uh, and I'm guessing he would have prepared to pleasure himself while watching uh, whoever he was videotaping. Um, but he was an important figure in the movement, uh, in the gay rights movement in the 1950s and 60s. So even though I wasn't so fond of him, he was an important figure. And he's in the book and he's also in one of our episodes and one of the more interesting episodes. So just because I didn't like someone didn't mean they weren't significant or important to include in in my book and ultimately the podcast. When you started to interview people for the book, did you find it hard for people to open up about their homosexuality and tell their story? Yeah, no, everyone was eager to speak with me, really eager to get their stories told because many for- thought they would be forgotten. There were two people, three people who asked me not to use their real names. Wendell Sayers, uh, the African-American attorney from Colorado, asked me to use a different name, so I called him Paul Phillips. Lisa Ben, um, who wrote that uh, gay newsletter, uh, vice versa, she asked me to uh, not use her real name because she was afraid that word might get back to her family and that it would embarrass them. And then a third person, Billy Talmadge, who was a school teacher who was afraid she might be harassed in her job if people knew that she was a lesbian. But in terms of sharing actual stories, people were very eager to tell me about their lives and what they lived through. The challenge was turning off the the tape recorder when I had more than enough material because I had to go on to the next interview and the people I interviewed still had more that they wanted to share with me. That was some of the heartbreak was leaving people who had more to say. And that would have been difficult because, again, you've got a lot of people get through. So how long did it take you to to write the book and to get all this uh, history down? From beginning to end, it was two and a half years. I started out by doing the interviews. I thought I would do 200 interviews. I got to, I think it was 89 interviews. And I thought if I don't stop doing the interviews now, I won't have time to transcribe them. I transcribed, I think, 47 or 46 interviews. And I thought if I don't start editing, I'll never finish now. Uh, I'll never finish in time to edit the book. And so I wound up with a total of 49 in the first edition of the book. So I added a few after I did the transcriptions. And then a, uh, we did a second edition 10 years later uh, for in 2002, and I added a few interviews. So we had a total of 62 interviews in the second edition. And by the way, the first edition was called Making History because there was some nervousness about putting the word gay in the title. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. So the second edition was called Making Gay History, but the first edition in 1992 was called Making History. We had the words lesbian and gay in the subtitle, but there was concern about the sales force being comfortable selling the book to bookstores and also about bookstore owners feeling comfortable putting the book face out if the word gay was in the title. It's it's hard to imagine, but that's what the world was like. Yeah, and you kind of think 92 wasn't that long ago, but then in saying that, we have come a long way, uh, especially as a community during that time. We have come such a long way since then. Uh, The world I grew up in is very different from the one we live in now. Even with the backlash we're experiencing now over trans rights issues and drag queen story hour and all the rest, we are so far and away better off than we were when I was growing up. We're essentially mainstream now. We're so mainstream that the uh, the nut job politicians who want to use us as a wedge issue have to go off after the most vulnerable within our community, uh, trans people, because they know now that, uh, at least in most of the Western world, gay men and lesbians are part of the community and are allowed to marry, and everyone has one or two or more in their family. And we're not scary creatures that live underneath rocks. It's very hard to demonize people who are as visible as we are now. Um, and this was one of the, the battle cries of the early movement in the post-Stonewall era, which was come out. Because uh, while we were invisible, it was possible to demonize us and marginalize us. It's not so easy anymore. Do you think if you had the word gay in your book title, it would have sold so well? I don't know what would have happened. I don't think anything would have happened. I think it would have been fine. Um, there was a book published in 1976 called uh, Gay American History by Jonathan Ned Katz. It was the first book of its kind, and no one seemed to, to blink at that. You know, we were nervous in ways we didn't need to be. But when my first book was published, The Male Couple's Guide, in 1988, the publisher would not put any images on the cover. The second edition, five years later, they let me use an image of clasped hands, two guys holding hands. And in the final edition, they allowed me to have two guys walking on the beach 
uh, holding hands, but shot from behind. I can track how things changed over time with, uh, with the covers of that original book, The Male Couple's Guide. Today, you have written a lot of books, but not all of them have been about the LGBTI community, though. There were a couple of books that were not on, on an LGBTQ topic. Uh, one was on uh, suicide, suicide loss, a question and answer book. I was inspired to write it because of my experience of having lost my father to suicide when I was 12. And then I did a book of humor called Expect the Worst, You Won't Be Disappointed. So I do have a sense of humor, even though most of my books seem rather serious. That's one thing us gays do have is a good sense of humor. It's almost like it's been built into us because we know how to have a good laugh at our own expense. Yeah, I think I think that for any oppressed group, it's important. Humor is very important. It's a way of coping. And one of the other books you wrote was called The Male's Couple Guide to Living Together. Now, that was published in the 1980s. That was pretty cutting edge for that time. That was the first one, The Male Couple's Guide to Living Together, Finding a Man, Making a Home, Building a Life. Um, it was published in 88, a rather conventional book, but because it was the first of its kind, it got an enormous amount of attention. But when I did interviews, I was afraid that I'd have to answer questions about relationships and it made me nervous to talk about that and my own relationship at the time. But we never got past that. The reporters were far no- more nervous than I was. Um, and the questions they asked over and over again were, when did you know you were gay? How did your family react? When did you know you were gay? How did your family react? Uh, and you know, if we, and if we allow gay people to marry, you know, well, they want to marry their pets. It was very basic stuff, and it it was good practice. Um, I was very nervous early on, and I was uncomfortable being that out publicly. Um, I was out to family and friends, but I was not out on television and radio, which is what happened when I when that first book was published. And so you were saying a lot of the questions were pretty stereotypical, and you could have yeah very easily after a while just had a little script and and you know. <laughs> yes, it was interesting that they'd say. If we were able to marry, would they marry their pets? That just gives you a bit of an insight of how no idea in lame. Oh terms my god! It was just the. It was always you know this is the slippery slope. If we allow gay people to get married, they're going to want to marry their dogs and cats. And I remember the last time I did a radio show, a radio call-in show where that came up. The, I knew what the person was alluding to. I said, you know what? If you want to marry your pet dog and you can get informed consent from your dog, you are welcome to marry your dog. Um, I said, but that's not what we're talking about. But it was always used as a as a weapon to say that if we allow to marry, all these bad things are going to happen. And that issue really has been put to rest in the U.S. as we recently saw when the, the Congress passed a bill and the president signed a law protecting same-sex marriage. Um, and also the same law protects interracial marriage in the U.S. And did you think whilst you were writing that book in 1988 that be here today with gay marriage being so normal? No, 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 not at all. I was often asked about, did I ever expect to see gay people being allowed to marry? And I always said, not in my lifetime. No, 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 absolutely not. Now it seems so normal. I did not, I had no expectation. You know, my partner and I had a commitment ceremony back in uh, 1996. My grandmother called it our wedding. She just saw it as a wedding, but it wasn't legally binding um, at the time. And there was no expectation that there would ever be such. Um, But here we are. Things have moved much more fast than I ever could have imagined. And in saying that too, it's quite interesting because around the world as a whole, it's legalized and let's just move forward. And um, in some of the ways, some of the countries have done them, like here in Australia, how we had to go to a vote, um, which was something that I'm sure many people over here in the community thought that our government could just pass, as a lot of other governments have done throughout the world, but instead they thought it was a great idea to get everyone in the community involved to do a vote, which I think that caused a lot of hatred. There was a lot of pride out there too from the community, but there was a lot of church groups and other minority groups. It activated them to oppose it. I would like the opportunity to vote on heterosexual marriage because I think that that heterosexual people often don't handle marriage very well and um, could learn a few things from how same-sex couples have handled their relationships. Yeah, I totally agree with you. Let's do it. (laughs) Let's see how that vote falls out. But we also have to be mindful that there are places in the world where it's still, uh, you could be killed for being gay. Um, And where governments, where there are laws that make it illegal for people to engage in same-sex relations. So it's uneven across the world, but certainly the trend in many countries is in the right direction. 
That is true. And also I think it's important to realise too, just because a lot of these countries have made the move, there's no guarantee that things can't happen in the future, that things can be pushed back. We're in a great spot at the moment, but as you are talking about previously, you touched on, there is still movement out there of these minority groups pushing back against the LGBTI community, especially with the transgender community and also the drag queen story time. Lately, yeah. uh, a few of them have been on children's uh, shows reading books and the hatred that have come from these minority groups, it's astonishing because you think, I thought we were past that as a community. Yeah, it's the same thing here. And I think a lot of the people who promote this hatred don't even believe what they're saying. It is opportunistic. It's a way of energizing their base of people who really don't know better and should. So I think with any of these hard-won riots, it's a mistake for us to ever think that the battle is over, that there are always people who are going to want to claw back the rights that have, have been extended to broader communities. There will always be people who are threatened by by people who are different, people who are in the minorities. So uh, I think as liberals... I put myself in that category of progressive people that we sometimes forget that simply because we've won a battle doesn't mean the war is over, that it is ongoing. These are hard won rights and they can be taken away from us, as we saw here in the US with reproductive rights. Yeah. And also, it's only a choice of uh, a bad government, as I think a lot of countries have seen over the last few years left wing governments that are not fit for governing. And all they've really got to do is roll back certain laws and the cards start to fall. Not just the LGBTI community, but a lot of minority groups are in a lot of trouble. Yeah, this is true. And it's fascinating now that I've lived as many decades as I have, is you get to see the cycles of progress and backlash, progress and backlash, and it's and it's inevitable. So if you could go back and tell your younger self anything, what would it be? Oh, I would tell my younger self that I was wasting a lot of energy on anxiety and that my life would turn out okay. I wanted the life I now have and thought it was impossible. I mean, there was no way of knowing that I could have a lifetime partner. I've been with my partner for for 29 years. Um, We live a pretty conventional life. We have friends and family. And uh, I was a terrified kid. I was a terrified kid. And I wish I could have reassured that child that it would all be okay. But I also wouldn't be where I am and who I am if not for everything I, I lived through. So I can't say that I wish it were different because if it were different, we wouldn't be talking today. You'd be talking to somebody else. So if not for the discrimination that I found in the field of journalism at CBS News, I would never have left to write the book that turned into the podcast that has led to our conversation today. And that's pretty amazing. I truly do believe the scars we get in our life's journey and the battles we face truly do make us the person we are today. Yeah. Um, and you never know if one thing changed, wh- how your life would turn out. Yeah. You know, it could be better, it could be worse. And, you know, I suppose at the end of the day, too, a bit like myself, I've been in a relationship for 20 years. We've just become the normal part of society now. People don't uh, give us a second glance. We can be just as boring as heterosexual couples. <laughs> yes. And even more boring sometimes. But yes, uh, but still there are times when we were at a wedding not long ago where we were the only older male couple and there were a couple of hundred people there and felt uncomfortable for a while. And then we got out on the dance floor and we were fine. But we still are a minority group. Uh, there there may be people who look at us differently. But for the most part, yeah, we're not uh, we're not anything special anymore. And when I first started doing my work years ago and I was on television talk shows, uh, it was enough to just be a gay guy who was out for you to be an object of interest. And now that certainly won't, at least here in the US, no one could care less. Yeah. And I think that's like a lot of Western countries now, people just kind of look and go, oh, yeah, next. Yeah, next. Exactly. You know, you might get a few curious people here and there, ask you a few random questions. But other than that, it's yeah. And, you know, it's good yeah. to see too the younger generations, the ones who are coming to age now, seeing how they act. And yeah, it's even more or less of a thing now, which I think it kind of reverts back to them stories that you originally recorded of these people who were the founding fathers of the whole gay movement. So children today can live the life they live. And I think that's quite important that we don't forget that as a community. I see the cutting edge now of the movement as education. And a lot of the work we do at Making Gay History is built around 
creating lessons that teachers can use in uh, history classes and then in universities to use our podcast episodes as part of a lesson about the history of the LGBTQ civil rights movement. So I think that it's so important for this history to be taught and not just to other LGBTQ people, but taught to all students as a part of the American story or part of the Australian story. Um, We are not something separate. We are a part of and um, it's not like you have to create a separate history. It's a, it's a history that's integrated throughout the larger story. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So thank you so much for making gay history and also giving uh, everyone the opportunity to, to listen to them stories because I think it's really important work that you and your organization are doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. And just to let your listeners know, they can find all of our episodes for Making Gay History wherever you get your podcasts or at makinggayhistory.com, um, where you'll find episode notes, full transcripts, archival photos, um, and you can learn all about the work. So um, so thank you. It's really a delight speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on LGBTI Conversations today. If you love listening to LGBTI Conversations, make sure to follow. This will help other people find us much easier. And also, make sure that you never miss out on an episode. Thanks for listening to LGBTI Conversations with me, Anthony Doik.